easily the most difficult aspect of the Christian faith is our concept of forgiveness. And therefore, it is no surprise that this is also the thing that Christians try hardest to ignore. A lot of Christians today like to complain about how immoral or godless our society is becoming, in particular, the immorality portrayed in the media, like movies, TV, books, etc. And Christians always focus on the same list of things when we make these complaints. Issues of sexuality, family, agnosticism, new ageism, witchcraft, etc. And never, I mean never, in any of these complaints is there any mention about the number of times numerous characters in numerous television shows, movies, etc. literally say phrases like, I will never forgive them. Usually these statements run, run along the lines of, I will never forgive them for this thing they have done for me but we can still work together to achieve our common goal. And the only thing more absurd, really, than that statement in and of itself is the idea in our culture that this is somehow a noble stance, that holding grudges for a lifetime is somehow the correct response to being wrong. I believe this attitude is the most destructive attitude in our society today, far beyond the destructiveness of anything in that litany of things we Christians like to complain about. And it's also the thing that we Christians do not comment on. We will complain about how the actress in a Christian movie showed a tiny amount of cleavage, true story. We will accuse Christian songwriters of outright heresy because they describe God in a way that makes us slightly uncomfortable. We will declare openly that American society is hurtling into depravity because someone said the S word once on television. But the growing number of good guy characters who refuse to forgive as a matter of principle goes unmentioned. We focus on superficial things and ignore something that exists at the very center of Christian life and faith, which is forgiveness. But it makes sense, really, because no one, I mean no one, actually likes the idea that we need to forgive our enemies. In fact, this concept runs counter to the laws of the universe. The basic cosmic law of cause and effect tells us that if someone wrongs us, we have the right to get back at that person. Forgiveness is unnatural in the truest sense of that word, and since it is unnatural, naturally, we Christians ignore it, in large part because we Christians don't want to forgive certain people either. We Christians, along with the rest of American society, emphasize our right as citizens to fight for what we deserve. And what's interesting here is that both liberals and conservatives make the arguments that they make because both sides honestly do believe they are just fighting for what they deserve. And that just goes to show how unproductive the idea of fighting for your own rights above anything else actually is. Because we all right want our own rights to be most important, and that's where a lot of our conflicts actually come from. But even more than that, we have gotten this notion somehow into our heads that fighting for our rights or fighting back or fighting for our own survival or our right to be ourselves, whatever that even actually means, etc., etc., we have gotten it into our heads that this is the most noble thing that we can do as human beings. When the fact of the matter is, fighting back and standing up for ourselves is a quality that we share with single-celled organisms. Bacteria fight for their right to exist and for their right to be themselves, that is, bacteria. Viruses, DNA strands so small that they don't even technically qualify as alive, fight for their right to exist and be themselves and reproduce. But fighting for ourselves and for our own right to exist and to be ourselves is the most noble thing that we as human beings can do? 
Now, disclaimer, I'm not telling you not to fight for your rights. I'm not telling you not to stand up for yourselves. I don't have the right to tell you these things, for one thing. What I'm telling you is that Christianity emphasizes a different way, a different way to deal with oppression, a different way to bring about positive change in the world, a way that acknowledges that while you can force someone to do what you want, you cannot force someone to agree with you and you cannot force someone to change their mind. This is a way that sees other human beings, even our enemies, even our oppressors, as people who are equally as human, equally as flawed, and equally worthy of mercy as ourselves. The way that Christianity emphasizes, that the way that Christianity has always emphasized, is forgiveness. Christianity seeks to create a world where the oppressor and the oppressed, the wounder and the wounded, can reconcile and learn to live together. Because at the end of it all, we're all human. We are all capable of great good and great evil. We are all capable of wounding and of being wounded. And which one we end up being, the wounder or the wounded, the wrongdoer or the one who has wrong done to them, usually has more to do with the accidents of circumstance than it has to do with personal choice. In my first year of seminary, I encountered a book called The Wounded Heart of God uh, by Andrew Sung Park. And it introduced me to an Asian concept called Han. Now, simply put, Han is woundedness, though it goes far beyond a feeling. Um, Park defines it as the critical wound of the heart generated by repression and oppression entrenched in the hearts of the victims of sin and violence, expressed through such diverse reactions as sadness, helplessness, hopelessness, resentment, hatred, and the will to revenge. In other words, woundedness, but in an active and reactive sense that causes the victims of sin and violence to act, think, and behave in certain ways. It can go so far as to be seen as a haunting presence of sorts that hangs over the victim's life. And this haunting presence can last beyond a single lifetime. It can spread to ge the generations that come afterwards and inspire, I think, the kinds of societal problems that our own country is now dealing with in the aftermath of slavery and abolition. Now, as soon as I encountered it, I was immediately drawn to this concept, first because I believe I have actually experienced a generational version of Han in my own life and family, but secondly, because it fits so well with what psychology now knows about the after effects of trauma and victimization, for example, PTSD. Now, if you have been reading along so far in my book, Secret Keepers, you may see a connection between this concept of woundedness and the way the characters' lives play out in the story. I built the entire premise of this story around, around the idea that wrongdoing, what is traditionally called sin, leaves open wounds in the psyches of both individuals and societies, and that these psychological or spiritual wounds have to be dealt with in order to move forward into a better future. And the question then becomes, how are they dealt with? So Park presents Han as a necessary counterpart to sin and argues that Han needs to be part of the Christian theology of sin and redemption. So the sinner is the one who does wrong, and Han is the psychological effect left behind in the victim of sin and wrongdoing. And in order for redemption to occur, the sinner and the sinned against must come together in something that is called repentance and forgiveness, and together break the sin-Han cycle. Now such thinking is certainly biblical. It lies behind the Christian emphasis on mercy and forgiveness. In fact, I would argue that this is exactly what Christian theology has been trying to say all along. We in the modern world have just kind of forgotten what this word sin originally meant. But that is a very long argument for another time. Secret Keepers tells the story of a wounded society. The woundedness comes from discrimination and the making of certain people less important or less human than other people. And in this story, both the oppressed and the oppressors are wounded by this dehumanization. Both act in certain ways 
such as denial, repression, violence, resentment, and the will to revenge, as Park puts it, because of the trauma left behind by this woundedness. And the woundedness comes from a long history in Secret Keepers, but it is brought to a head in the first event of the book, the destruction of the city Koar. This is the wound that brings the three main characters into conflict with each other. This is the wound that brings them together. And this is the wound that they must seek to repair together, even though all of it happened before the three of them were even born. And this is because repentance and forgiveness are not isolated things. They form a single whole called redemption or reconciliation or atonement. And Christian theology emphasizes both because one is mostly powerless without the other. Repentance and forgiveness are meant to exist together, and only together can they bring about positive change.